Hello and welcome to Critical Care Fundamentals. These lectures are meant to be brief and the goal is to give you, the busy provider, a basic framework of critical care topics. My name is Frank Lodicerto. I'm a clinical associate professor at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. I also serve as a critical care fellowship program director at Geisinger Medical Center in Danville, Pennsylvania. I work in both the adult and pediatric critical care units. Today's topic is the management of shock part two. So if you haven't, Go back and listen to the basics of shock and the management of shock part one. But today, we're going to talk about the specific drugs. In fact, we looked at last time, we explained why hypotension is an emergency. Um, we started to talk about the receptors, uh, specifically where the catecholamine drugs uh, worked and uh, their usage, and that we'll get into that more today on specific drugs. And we'll end with some of the newer treatments for refractory vasoplegia. So the first drug that we're going to talk about is norepinephrine. So this is probably the most widely used um, vasoactive medication. Uh, I put the receptors uh, here to show you that it works uh, predominantly on alpha-1, so it causes vasoconstriction. But it also has small but significant beta-1 effects. So it can increase heart rate and it can increase contractility. Um, most people think about um, uh, arteriolar vasoconstriction, but probably one of the uh, as important, if not more important, uh, is the fact that norepinephrine and probably other vasoconstrictors as well work on uh, uh, venoconstriction. So why is that so important? Well, most of our uh, blood uh, sits in the venous system. So if we can increase our venous tone, we're going to increase uh, venous return. By increasing venous return, we can increase uh, stroke volume and therefore increased cardiac output. So, yeah, it does have a significant uh, effect on vasoconstriction, uh, but the venoconstrictor effects may actually, uh, by increasing venous return, may have a very significant impact. Um, uh, and that's and that's probably why uh, there have been some trials looking at very low dose of norepinephrine um, early in septic shock. It may be uh, not only because of the vasoconstrictor effects and increasing SVR, but also the fact that it can increase uh, venous return and restore uh, stroke volume and cardiac output. But as I mentioned, it does have significant beta-1 effects. So it can increase um, heart rate and may cause dysrhythmias. Uh, however, uh, this is not something I typically worry about. Uh, it can happen, but it's not something I typically worry about. Uh, many times our patients are tachycardic uh, because they're in shock and, and hypotensive, and they're trying to compensate with their tachycardia. So I wouldn't worry too much about this. But it does increase uh, our inotropy, which is a very significant effect uh, because well, as we talk about, uh, norepinephrine is used most commonly in septic shock. And in septic shock, which uh, isn't talked about as much, but a uh, patient can have Patients can have myocardial dysfunction. Uh, so uh, this inotropic effect may have a very significant role uh, by increasing inotropy and contractility. So I mentioned, yes, it's used in distributive shock, particularly septic shock. Uh, it can be used in forms of obstructive shock as well. So for instance, a patient has a massive PE and they're hypotensive. And to restore mean arterial blood pressure and to perfuse the right heart, um, uh, we, we can commonly start a very titratable infusion of norepinephrine until other uh, medications like TPA are, are used or other therapies um, to uh, bust that clot and restore um, flow. Uh, another use for it is surprising, but shouldn't be as surprising now as this data is uh, getting a little older, uh, is cardiogenic shock. In fact, this uh, was a study comparing uh, norepinephrine versus dopamine, and it actually uh, there was no major difference between dopamine and, and norepinephrine in all forms of shock. But the one sh uh, form of shock that norepinephrine outperformed dopamine, which uh, a few years back was probably the one of the most most uh, commonly used drugs in cardiogenic shock, it, but it outperformed dopamine in cardiogenic shock. So uh, you know you can make a strong argument that uh, it's a, it is a uh, not only the drug of choice but maybe a, a very important uh, drug in cardiogenic shock. Typically, starting doses are 0.05 mics per kilo per minute. Now I know many institutions, including um, uh, ones that I've worked in. Uh, uh, have a max dose where you can only go up to 30 mics a minute or somewhere else, 20 uh, mics per minute, whatever the number is. I think this is uh, unfortunate because 
uh, a patient who is um, uh, larger, taller, uh, weighs more, uh, maybe on the maximal, quote unquote, maximal dose of norepinephrine, but it's just not enough norepinephrine. They need a little bit more. Where some patients who are smaller are on the quote unquote maximum dose, and this is a very high dose for them. So it's it's really doesn't equate. I think it should be uh, weight based. Uh, and I'm not, not only saying this because I'm a pediatrician, but I really feel that it should be weight based uh, for those reasons that I've just mentioned. So the next vasoactive medication we'll talk about is epinephrine. Um, epinephrine works everywhere, uh, and I'll explain. Um, what I mean by that, but at lower doses, it'll work on beta-1 receptors as well as beta-2 receptors. Um, so it'll increase, um, uh, cause inotropy, increase contractility, as well as increase heart rate. It can also cause uh, vasodil uh, vasodilatation as well, but the predominant effects are beta-1 effects at lower doses. Now, as it gets, as uh, epinephrine is titrated up at higher doses, it can have alpha-1 effects causing vasoconstriction. Now, epinephrine molecules don't talk to themselves and say, hey, we're at higher doses now, let's get off the heart, let's start jumping on the blood vessels and causing vasoconstriction. So you're not losing your beta-1 uh, beta effects, um, causing the inotropic effects, but as you go at higher doses, it's going to start working more in the vasculature and increase vasoconstriction. So what doses are we talking about? Well, um, it's hard to find out, but definitely, some, but definitely less than 0.2 mics per kilo per minute, you're getting... Um, um, inotropic uh, effects, but but maybe actually even at 0.1 above 0.1 mics per kilo per minute, um, you're you're starting to get some alpha effects. But definitely when you get above 0.2 mics per kilo per minute, you're getting uh, more alpha effects uh, as you get to that higher doses of 0.2 mics per kilo per minute. So if you're starting epinephrine uh, for uh, the inotropic effects, then then you might want to keep your doses at a lower dose, uh, definitely less than 0.2 mics per kilo per minute. Or if you're starting it for uh, hypotension related to bradycardia or cardiogenic shock, where, which is a, a use for it. Uh, it can be used in adult septic shock. Uh, in fact, it's been studied head-to-head -head with norepinephrine, and there is no outcomes uh, difference. Um, it is... Uh, a, currently a second-line drug in uh, the uh, septic shock guidelines, but the data would suggest that it is as good as uh, norepinephrine for adult septic shock. We've seen it used in anaphylactic shock. Uh, it actually is also used in cardiac arrest, and the reason we use it in cardiac arrest at high doses of one milligram is because we're trying to get the alpha effects and increase vasoconstriction and increase coronary perfusion pressure. But the harmful effect could be the beta effect. So you have a heart that is ischemic and you're telling it to work harder by increasing heart rate, increasing contractility. So that may be why epinephrine uh, has not really showed um, a significant effects in a cardiac arrest. But again, it's for the alpha effects. And then one of the main uses is pediatric septic shock. So in younger children, uh, particularly children less than one year of age, they have a significant cardiogenic component as uh, different cytokines are released, causing um, decreased um, cardiac function. So epinephrine is started in these uh, kids, uh, particularly less than one, but any age really, uh, who are in what we call cold shock. If that term doesn't make sense to you, please go back and review the basics of shock. So uh, if your child's in cold shock and you believe they're in septic shock, then the uh, primary drug to use here is um, epinephrine. Some of the harmful effects that we can talk about later is it does metabolize glucose to lactate uh, in a non-anaerobic pathway, so it can uh, increase your lactate production. Uh, it also can increase insulin resistance and cause hyperglycemia, uh, which can be some um, uh, of the effects that you may see on an epinephrine infusion. The next drug is dopamine, and dopamine works very similar to what I've just described to you in epinephrine. At lower doses, dopamine works on um, or causes inotropy. At higher doses, and again, uh, lower doses uh, are about 5 to 10 mics per kilo per minute, you're primarily getting beta-1 effects or you're getting inotropic effects. But as you're getting higher doses, uh, greater than 10 mics per kilo per minute, you're starting to get alpha effects, just like I've described with, with epinephrine. So it can be used. Um, however, there are better drugs in cardiogenic shock, and I've just told you that uh, norepinephrine outperformed dopamine in cardiogenic shock. Uh, however, if your patient has significant bradycardia and uh, decreased cardiac output, then this may be one of the primary uses for dopamine here.
Uh, I put septic shock question mark. It, it, it was commonly used in pediatric septic shock. However, this has fallen out of favor with some new data uh, suggesting that epinephrine would be the better drug to start in pediatric septic shock, particularly if your kid is in cold shock. And I did mention here one of the main side effects is it's very arrhythmogenic. So in that study, looking at norepinephrine and dopamine, one of the biggest side effects was arrhythmias. And, and this is probably our most arrhythmogenic uh, medication that we use. So this is the trial looking at all forms of shock. This is the SOAP2 trial, which I'll include in the show notes. But looking at all comers in shock, there was really no difference. However, if you look at the subset of patients in cardiogenic shock, norepinephrine outperformed these patients or outperformed dopamine. So which drugs are better? Really, there's uh, I've been telling you a lot about the vasopressors uh, or vasoactive medications. Uh, but really, um, Meyer Berg and colleagues studied norepinephrine versus epi. Uh, epi did have some um, significant side effects. However, there were no differences in um, 28 or 90 day mortality between the two drugs. Uh, epinephrine has also been studied um, against dobutamine and norepinephrine. Uh, and again, there is no mortality difference between these groups. So there isn't great data. We base it a lot of the medications we use based on the physiology and what we know the physiology to, to do. The next vasoactive medication is phenylephrine. And phenylephrine, I mentioned earlier, was a pure uh, vasoconstrictor. It only works on alpha-1 receptors. Uh, so it has no intrinsic inotropy. Uh, so um, it doesn't increase heart rate at all. In fact, um, it may actually decrease uh, a patient's heart rates um, because of the reflex bradycardia by causing vasoconstriction. Where do we use it? Well, it has really no main use. Uh, people have used it in sepsis uh, who are vasoplegic and norepinephrine is not cutting it. You may add uh, phenylephrine. Um, but again, this is even not in, uh, necessarily in the guidelines. But again, uh, based on the physiology, uh, a lot of shops just can't titrate the norepinephrine at higher doses. They're not able to. They're, the, the institution won't let them. So they may add phenylephrine to restore some vascular tone. So refractory, refractory vasoplegia. Um, so this drug can increase the, not only your uh, systemic vascular resistance, but also your pulmonary vascular resistance. So it wouldn't be the greatest drug to use in someone with cardiogenic shock or right heart failure as it just increases the afterload of both the RV and LV. So I'll mention a little bit about push-dose pressors because that's, that's kind of a use for phenylephrine. Um, uh, a lot of this is coming up. Uh, phenylephrine is, is com it comes up in uh, uh, pre-made syringes where usually each cc is about 100 mics of phenylephrine. Uh, if your institution does not have um, the pre-made syringes of phenylephrine, well, typically they come in vials of uh, 10 milligrams per 1 ml. So you would take 1 ml, which is 10 milligrams, and you would mix that into, if you had a 100 ml bag, you would mix that 1 ml to a 100 um, uh, ml bag. Uh, you, would, you would basically pull up 10 cc's and that would give you, for every one cc you instill, that would give you 100 mics of phenylephrine. If your institution doesn't have 100 mic bags and they have 250 uh, uh, ml bags, then you would take uh, two vials of phenylephrine. So two mLs total, or a total of 20 milligrams. You would instill that into 250 ml bag. So then you would drop a 10 cc's of it, uh, so a 10 cc syringe, and every mL you inject would be 80 mics. Um, of phenylephrine. Now, uh, I typically give a starting dose of one to two uh, cc's or anywhere from 80 to uh, uh, 200 mics uh, for push dose to restore vascular tone if that's a situation where the patient is hypotensive and vasodilated. Something quick would be the push dose presser or the push dose of phenylephrine. It works fairly quick within a minute, uh, lasts for about 10 to 20 minutes, and you can repeat this dose as needed every two to five minutes. Um, another use would be uh, people who are using push-dose inotropes. And this is where, um, if you didn't want to use uh, phenylephrine here, uh, if you didn't have it available, well, most places have uh, epinephrine um, um, for codes. So you can use a push-dose inotrope. This will give you both beta effects and alpha effects. So it would give you an inopressor. So uh, I never give one milligram of epinephrine to anyone with a pulse. Um, uh, in fact, it's questionable if you give it uh, if they don't have a pulse as well, uh, based on some of the ACLS data that we have. However, uh, if you were to take a 10 ml syringe and uh, empty out only one ml, so left with 10 mLs of normal saline in a, in a, in a saline flush, 
then you would drop one ml, one ml of epinephrine from a uh, cardiac amp. So an amp contains 100 mics per ml. So you'd be um, um, taking 100 mics in that one ml and adding it to the 10 ml syringe. So now a one cc push from that syringe would give you 10 mics per one ml. Um, Typically, I would give the, this, uh, the, the onset of a push dose inotrope is quick within a minute. It will last you five to 10 minutes, and you can repeat or push one to two mLs as needed to restore uh, blood pressure in patients who are hemodynamically unstable. Okay, so that's push dose, push dose vasopressors and push dose inotropes. So I realize this is getting a little long, so I'm gonna take a pause here. When we start back next time, we'll start talking about dibutamine. So I hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.